Welcome back to this series on topology. In today's video, we'll conclude our look at compactness by proving three important theorems about the compact subsets of Euclidean space. As always, you can find the playlist containing all the videos in this series by clicking on the info thing that should appear right now. Also, if you enjoy these videos, please consider giving them a like so that other people can find them more easily. With that out of the way, let's have a look at the theorems we'll be proving in this video. The first theorem we'll prove is that closed and bounded intervals of the real line are compact. So far, we've proved a lot of results about compact spaces, but we haven't really seen that many examples. The reason for this is that proving that some subset or space is compact is kind of difficult in general. If you think back to the definition of compactness, it says that a space is compact if every open cover of that space has a finite subcover. Thus, in order to prove that a space is compact, you have to be able to show that any open cover can be reduced to a finite subcover. Now, in general, arbitrary open covers could be really weird. Therefore, in order to construct a general argument that performs this reduction from an open cover to a finite subcover um, requires some strong properties on your space. Therefore, we won't usually prove directly that some space is compact. Rather, we'll use some existing spaces, which we know to be compact, and the results we proved in the previous videos to show that a given space is compact. For instance, we showed that images of compact spaces under continuous maps are again compact. So if we can somehow construct a continuous map from a space we know to be compact to some other space, then we know that the image of that map um, will also be compact. Now, one of the basic types of spaces we'll be able to prove that they are compact are closed and bounded intervals of the real line, but we'll see that uh, this requires some effort. The second theorem we'll see in this video is the heine borel theorem, which characterizes the compact subsets of Euclidean space Rn. It says that a subset of Rn is compact if and only if it is closed and bounded. So we can see the heine borel theorem is a generalization of the previous theorem, and we'll see in the proof that we need the previous theorem about the closed and bounded intervals in R in order to prove heine borel Of course, the heine borel theorem will now give us a bunch of examples of compact spaces because, well, any subset of Euclidean space which is closed and bounded is such an example. The final theorem we'll prove in this video is the extreme value theorem for general topological spaces. It says that if we have some compact space X and a continuous map, that goes from x to the real line, so it's some function that takes on real values, then the function f is bounded, and moreover, it attains its maximum and minimum values on the space x. In other words, the continuous function f can't take on arbitrarily large values, and moreover, there exist points in x where f has a maximal value and where f has a minimal value. Okay, so with this overview of what we'll prove today, let's move on to the first theorem. Our first goal will be to prove the theorem that closed and bounded intervals of the real line are compact. Because we're dealing with properties of the real line, this is more of an analysis proof than it is one of topology. Moreover, the proof is kind of fiddly with a bunch of epsilons and deltas, so if you can't follow along precisely, don't worry about it. You can just accept this theorem as fact, and um, the details of the proof aren't really um, that important. Okay, so to start the proof, we choose some arbitrary closed and bounded interval of the real line. So we let A to B be a closed interval of the real line, and we want to prove that this is compact, so we need to show that every open cover of this closed and bounded interval has a finite subcover. So we take some open cover, which I'll call u, of this interval. Now the property of the real line we'll be using is that every non-empty and bounded subset of the real line has a supremum. Remember that a supremum of some set is just its least upper bound. And for this proof, we'll choose a clever set, which we'll take the supremum of, and this will then allow us to prove that we can actually uh, reduce our arbitrary open cover to a finite subcover. In order to do this, we're going to define a set capital X to be the set of all points small x in the half open interval going from small a to small b, such that the closed interval going from a to x 
is covered by finitely many of the elements of u. So let's draw a picture of this. So we have the real line and we have some closed interval going from A to the point B. And now in order to get elements of this set capital X, we choose some point which lies strictly to the right of A and lies to the left of B. So this could be such an X. And then we consider this closed interval going from A to X. Now, if this closed interval here is covered by finitely many of the sets in our open cover U, then we add this point X to the set capital X. Now, our goal will be to show that the point B actually lies within the set capital X, because then in that case, this closed interval from A to B will be covered by finitely many of the sets in our open cover U, and hence will be compact. To do this, what we're going to do is we're going to take the largest element that lies within capital X and show that this has to be equal to the point B. So essentially we're seeing how far we can extend over in this direction closed intervals that are still covered by finitely many of these sets in U, and then we want to show that in this way we can extend all the way to the point small b. Okay, so the intuitive idea of taking the largest value of x will be captured by taking the supremum of this set. Now this set is bounded because it's a subset of this half open interval from A to B, which is a bounded interval. However, we're not quite sure yet that this set is not empty. So the first step we need to do in order to be able to even think about taking the supremum of this set is to show that this set is not empty. Okay, so I'll write this down as a claim. So X is not the empty set. To prove this, we proceed as follows. The first thing we're going to notice is that the point A here has to be contained in one of the sets of our open cover U because U covers this entire uh, closed interval from A to B. So there is some set UA which lies in our open cover which contains A. So in the picture this UA contains the point A but it might not be um, a simple open interval like I've drawn it here. It might be more complicated, but let's just illustrate it like this. Now, because this set UA is contained in the open cover U, it is in particular open, which means that we can find a small neighborhood around the point A that is still contained in UA. So by openness, there is some epsilon greater zero such that the interval a minus epsilon to a plus epsilon is still contained within ua. Now our goal is to show that this set capital X here is non-empty, so we want to find some small x that is strictly larger than a, such that the closed interval from a to this small x is covered by finitely many of the sets in u. Now what we've done so far is we've constructed some small interval around a, where all of the points in this interval lie completely within this covering set UA. Hence, to get some point in the set capital X, we just need to take some point which lies strictly to the right of A, but is still contained within this um, open pink interval. Maybe I'll call this point here XA. So this is some point which is strictly greater than A, but still lies within this um, epsilon neighborhood around it. Hence, we can find some point XA, which lies within this epsilon neighborhood around um, the point A. And moreover, we can choose XA so that it's strictly greater than A. And well, now, if you consider the closed interval going from A to XA, this lies completely within this um, open neighborhood around a, and this open neighborhood in turn lies within UA, so this closed interval from A to XA will lie entirely within the set UA. So then the closed interval from A to XA, well this is a subset of this um, epsilon neighborhood, 
around A, which is in turn a subset of UA. Therefore, this interval here is covered by one of the elements of our open cover U, and this is finitely many, and this means that XA will lie in the set capital X. So then this closed interval from A to XA is covered by finitely many. So finitely many sets in U. Hence, XA is an element of the set capital X. Okay, and this proves our claim. Before moving on, I'd just like to briefly review this argument because we'll see this same type of thing crop up um, two more times in the proof. So we started with some point A, and we noted that because U is an open cover, there has to be some set UA which contains this point. And now we know that UA is open, but it could be very complicated. It doesn't have to be an interval. But in order for this argument to work, we have to find some point to the right of A, namely this XA, such that all the points between A and XA lie within this uh, covering set UA. Hence, it's not enough just to find some other point which lies to the right of A, which lies in UA, because in between those two points, there could be a hole in the set UA. However, we can guarantee that we can find some point which is strictly larger than A, and for which all points between A and this point lie in the set UA, by first taking such an epsilon neighborhood around A, which we know lies completely within UA, and then kind of just taking a point which lies within this epsilon neighborhood to the right of A. Therefore, if our point is in some open set, we can always find a point that's strictly greater than it and such that all the points between these two points lie in that open set. Okay, so we've now proved that the set capital X is non-empty and we already noted that it's bounded. So we're now able to take its supremum. So we let C be the supremum of this set X. Now, because the supremum of the closed interval um, from A to B is just B, and moreover, because X is a subset of this closed interval here, we know that the supremum of X can be at most B. So then C is less than or equal to B. Again, this is just because the supremum of such a closed interval here is just its right endpoint, namely B. And since X is a subset of this interval, its supremum can at most get smaller. So in our picture, the supremum C might be located here, although it could be all the way over to the right where B is. Now, the next thing we're going to show is that the closed interval from A to C is actually covered by finitely many of the sets in U. The reason this isn't um, immediate is because the supremum of X doesn't necessarily have to lie in the set X. So while all the points in capital X satisfy that the closed interval from A to that point is covered by finitely many of the sets in U, this doesn't necessarily have to hold for the supremum, which may not lie in the set X. But basically what we're showing with this claim is that in fact the supremum actually does lie in the set capital X. The argument for this is again very similar to what we saw when we proved that X was not empty. We're going to choose some open um, cover element UC, which contains the point C. So we let C be an element of UC, which in turn is an element of our open cover. Again, this exists because U is a cover, so every point in this closed interval here has to lie within one of the covering sets, and we already showed here that uh, C is less than or equal to B. In fact, we can even amend this here. C lies between A and B because we already know that there is some point in X here which is strictly greater than A, so the supremum in particular also has to be strictly greater than A. Now, we're again going to use the openness of this set UC to find some epsilon neighborhood around the point C, which lies completely in UC. Again, there is some epsilon greater zero, such that uh, C minus epsilon, C plus epsilon, 
as a subset of uc. We're now going to argue that there must be some point of the set capital X which lies to the left of C, but still within this epsilon neighborhood. So let's call this point X. So there is some point X in capital X, such that X lies between C minus epsilon and C. This follows from the fact that C is a supremum, or at least upper bound, because suppose there would not be any points of the set capital X between C and C minus epsilon. So basically, we wouldn't have any points of the set capital X in this um, open interval here. Well, in that case, C minus epsilon would be an upper bound to the set capital X, because there's no points in X that are strictly greater than it. However, C minus epsilon is strictly less than C, so it will be a smaller upper bound to the set X than C would be. However, by assumption, C is the supremum of X, so it's the least upper bound, so this is not possible. Therefore, there has to be some point X lying between C minus epsilon and C, or else we could reduce the size of C and still retain its upper bound property. Now, the reason we went through the trouble of finding such a element of the set X, which lies between C minus epsilon and C, is because now we know that, in fact, the closed interval from A to this X is covered by finitely many of our sets in U. So then the closed interval from A to X is covered by finitely many sets of U. And moreover, we know that all of the points between X and C lie in this uh, covering set UC. Since the closed interval going from X to C is completely contained within UC, the same covering sets, so the same sets that cover this closed interval going from A to X, will also cover the interval going from A to C. If this isn't completely clear, you should look at the picture. So we know that finitely many of the sets in U cover this closed interval going from A to X, and we can even assume that UC is amongst these sets, because if, well, it wasn't, we could just add it and we would still have finitely many of the covering sets. Moreover, we know that all of these points between X and C, including X and C, lie within UC, so Basically, the same sets we had before will also cover this closed interval going from A to C. Okay, so maybe the sentence wasn't quite correct. We can say the same sets plus UC will definitely cover the closed interval from A to C. Hence, we have shown the claim that the closed interval from A to C is covered by finitely many of the sets in U. Here again, you can see this a bit fiddly argument where we need um, to show that because UC is open, we can find some point that lies to the left of C, but we also need to have that all the points between C and that point are contained in UC. We need to do this by considering such a neighborhood and then picking an appropriate point. Okay, so now we're almost done with the proof because, well, if C is equal to the point B, then we're done. So if C is actually equal to B, then we are done, because in that case, we've shown that the interval going from A to B is covered by finitely many sets of our open cover, and hence uh, it will be compact. We've already noted that C has to be less than or equal to B, so the only other possibility that remains is that C is strictly less than B, and we're going to show that this is impossible. So we're now going to suppose that C is strictly less than B and derive a contradiction. To get this contradiction, the argument will be quite similar to what we've done before. So we again note that C is contained in some UC, so one of the covering sets, and that we can find some neighborhood around the point C, which is contained in UC. Now, if C is strictly less than B, then we can in fact find a point which is contained in this neighborhood, which I'll call Y, which lies strictly between C and B, and for which 
all the points lying between C and Y are contained in UC. Since we've done basically the same thing twice already, I'm not going to write down all the details of how to get this Y, but we can get some y, which satisfies on the one hand that it's strictly greater than c and strictly smaller than b. And moreover, all the points lying between c and y lie within uc. So we can say, for example, that the closed interval going from c to y is contained in uc. And again, the way to do this properly would be to first find such a um, epsilon neighborhood around c and then choose a point that's on the one hand, small enough to be strictly smaller than b, and on the other hand, is still large enough uh, in order to be strictly greater than c. Okay, but now from the above here, we know that the closed interval from a to c is covered by finitely many of the sets in u. So we know that this is covered by any sets in U. And now by the same argument, because all of these points that lie between C and Y are contained in UC, we can deduce that, in fact, also, the closed interval going from A to Y is covered by finitely many of the sets in our open cover U. So since um, this closed interval from C to Y is contained in UC, the same sets, maybe plus uc, uh, will cover the closed interval going from a to y. But this implies that y lies in the set capital X. But on the other hand, y is strictly greater than c, which is supposed to be the supremum of x, and this is a contradiction. So we've assumed that c is strictly less than b, and we've derived a contradiction, so this is not possible. We also already know that c has to be less than or equal to b, so the fact that c is strictly greater than b is also not possible. Therefore, c has to be equal to b, and in that case, we're done and we've proved uh, compactness. Okay, so as you can see, the proof didn't really use many difficult ideas, but we had to repeat this fiddly argument with the finding the point to the left or the right, such that all the points between are still contained in some set, and so on. We have to repeat that many times, and hence it's a bit uh, complicated. I hope you are nonetheless able to follow it, and if there's any part that seems suspicious to you, you should probably just write out that uh, part by yourself by hand and check that everything makes sense. In the next two theorems, we'll see all of our hard work from the previous two videos pay off because we can basically just assemble results and prove some nice theorems. The first of one is the heine borel theorem, which exactly characterizes all of the compact subsets of Euclidean space Rn. It says that a subset S of Rn is compact if and only if it is closed and bounded. And both of these things are pretty easy to check, so this gives us a nice description of all the compact subsets of Rn. We will have to show two directions. So the first one is that the compact subsets of Rn are closed and bounded, and then we'll have to show that if a subset is closed and bounded, then it's compact. So we'll start with the easy direction, which is proving compact implies closed and bounded. For this, we suppose that S is a compact subset of Rn. Now we need to recall some results we saw in the last video. There we showed that compact subsets of Hausdorff spaces are always closed. Moreover, we know that Rn is Hausdorff, for example, because it's a metric space. So recall that Hausdorff means you can separate any two distinct points by open sets. And in a metric space, this is always possible because basically if you have two points that are not the same, then they'll be separated by some positive distance. And then you can just take, say, like a third of that distance and take open balls surrounding those points with a third of the distance between them, those won't intersect and they'll be open, and so any two points can be separated by open subsets in any metric space. So that shows that Rn is Hausdorff because we have a metric on it. Now since Rn is Hausdorff, uh, 
S is closed by the proposition we saw in the previous video, which said that compact subsets of Hausdorff spaces are always closed. Moreover, we saw also in the previous video that compact subsets of metric spaces are always bounded, and Rn is a metric space, for example, with a Euclidean metric. So since Rn is a metric space, We also know that S is bounded by the result from the previous video. Okay, so that shows that whenever we have a compact subset of Rn, it's automatically closed and bounded. Conversely, for the other direction, let's suppose that we have some closed and bounded subset of Rn. So we let S be a subset of Rn, which is closed and bounded. Now, being bounded for a subset of Euclidean space means that there's some closed cube of a certain um, size which contains the set entirely. So then there is some radius, which is some positive number, such that the cube, so this, this cube going from minus r to r, and this is an n-dimensional cube, that this contains our set S. So this is just the definition of being a bounded subset of Euclidean space. Now we know from the previous theorem that a closed interval, for example, the one going from minus R to R, is compact. So from before, we know that this closed interval going from minus r to r is compact. Okay, and now using a result from the last video, we can infer that the n-fold product of this interval is also compact. Remember that we proved in the last video that finite products of compact spaces are again compact. And this here is precisely such a finite product of compact spaces. So since finite products preserve compactness, we now know that this cube is compact. Okay, so we've now shown that this cube, which contains S, is compact, and now we have that S is a closed set of some compact space, and if you remember again from the last video, we showed that closed subsets of compact spaces are themselves again compact. So since S, this is a subset of this cube, is a closed subset of a compact space. It means that it is compact. And with that, we're done. Okay, so as you can see here, this proof uses almost all of the results we proved previously on compactness. So this is a really nice theorem that combines all of the stuff we've seen so far, and if you'd have to prove it from scratch without using these results, it would be quite involved. Moreover, I hope this proof illustrates how we can use the fact that some basic spaces are compact, like this closed interval here, in order to um, construct proofs that more complicated spaces, like this subset S here, are compact. Let's move on to the last theorem, which is the extreme value theorem. It says that whenever we have a compact space x and a continuous function, f going from x to the real line, so it's a function that takes on real values, then that function is bounded, and moreover, it attains its maximum and minimum values on the space x. So what do I mean by attaining its minimum and maximum values on the space x? Well, this means that there are some small x max and some x min 
that lie in the space capital X such that f of this x max is greater or equal to any f of y for all y and x and moreover f of x min is less than or equal to f of y for all y and x. And well, this will immediately imply that f is bounded on x because all the values of f lie between f of x max and f of x min. Now you may have seen a version of the extreme value theorem for functions going from closed intervals of the real line to the real line itself, but this holds more generally for any compact space x. And while well, closed intervals of the real line are just one example you could choose for x. The proof of this is actually pretty simple with uh, all of the results we've proved so far. So the first thing we notice is that since x is compact and f is continuous, we know that the image of x under f will also be compact. This is something we saw in the first video on compactness, namely that images of compact sets under continuous functions are again compact. Now f of x, so this image space, is a compact subset of the real line. And so by the heine borel theorem it is closed and bounded. Now, because this image is a closed and bounded subset of the real line, it will contain its infimum and its supremum. So hence, the infimum of this set f of x, and I'll call this um, f min, this lies within f of x. And similarly, the supremum of f of x, which I'll call f max, this also lies in f of x. Okay, so something's weird with the brackets. Let's do it like that. Now, in particular, because the infimum f min and the supreme f max lie within the image, there must be some points in x which are mapped to those points f min and f max. So thus, there are x min, which gets mapped to um, f min under f and x max which gets mapped to f max under f. Therefore because f min is the infimum of the entire image of x under f we have that um, f of x min this is just f min and this has to be less than or equal to all f of y or any y in x. And similarly, f of x max, which is f max, this is greater or equal to all f of y for y in x. And this proves the proposition. Okay, so as you can see, the proof of this was not particularly involved given all of the results we've proved so far. The only bit which is maybe a bit mysterious is the step where we inferred that when we have a closed and bounded subset of the real line, then that subset contains its infimum and supremum. This is a basic result of real analysis, but we actually have established the tools in this topology course in order to prove it. I won't do so here because it would take us a bit far afield. However, if you want, you can try to think about this for yourself. The two ingredients you'll need is that first, the infimum and supremum of sets are both limit points so this means that any neighborhood around the supremum, for example, contains some point of the set in question, namely this image set, other than the supremum itself. Okay, so infimum and supremum are both limit points. This is the first thing you would need to prove. And then the second thing you need to prove is that whenever you have a closed set, then it will contain all of its limit points. In fact, that's even a characterization of closed sets so a set in a topological space is closed if and only if it contains all of its limit points. 
then if you have those two things proved, then the fact that this image set here is closed and the fact that infima and supreme are limit points will imply that they're contained in that set. All right, with that, I'm done with what I wanted to say in this video. I hope this trilogy of videos on compactness has given you some idea of what the concept of compactness means and why it could be useful. Moreover, I hope that um, these videos have provided you with some basic tools for identifying compact sets and proving things about them. In the next video, we'll be proving the closed map lemma, which allows us, under certain assumptions, to easily prove that certain maps are either quotient maps, topological embeddings, or homeomorphisms. And there again, one essential part of the proof will involve compactness.